Oh, yo, start recording. I don't know if we started yet. I see it. It says you're recording. Nah, here we go. Here we go. Here we okay. go. <clears throat> yo, ladies and gentlemen, what is up? Trayvon Copeland, respect my nerds. Y'all know what time is. I'm repping Pac Man today. But yo, listen, today we got a special guest. I've been meaning to talk to this man for so long. We finally got him on. He's here, ladies and gentlemen, in the flesh. Mr. Christopher Williams, but also known as Chris Cross. My man, Chris Cross, how you doing? Was it, is he in there? He in there? What happened? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I thought it was you. I thought you uh, I know, you. right? He's the evil twin. He's the evil I got, twin. Like, the real many, Chris Cross. Many identities. Okay, so, so the real Chris Cross is either locked up or he just got a bunch of personalities. What, what, whatever it is, we talking to somebody, gambit. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who don't know, Mr. Chris Cross is a comic book illustrator, mostly known for his penciling from Milestone to Blood Syndicate and my favorite heroes. But he's also done stuff for Marvel's Captain Marvel and uh, also some stuff for DC's Firestorm. And his resume just goes as long as Peachtree, if you in Atlanta, or like, uh, let me see, a long road. I don't know what's a long road. In uh, New York, like I IKEA was today during the during the uh, COVID situation. Right there we go. Around the that. block, around the parking lot. There we go. Oh man, you worked on Shadow Man too. That's cool. You also does other stuff for the X Men. So, ladies and gentlemen, I did a little bit of everything. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't know, Mr. Chris Cross attended a New York City School of Visual Arts in the 1990s, and while doing so, he caught his break with DC Comics in Milestone, where he got to do a little bit of work because they were so impressed by his drawing. We're about to get into that right now. Mr. Chris Cross, how did you get your start with uh, Milestone? Let's get into that. <clears throat> well, um, Milestone, that was a trip because uh, there was a guy named Brian David Marshall uh, who was telling me about uh, this a guy. Funny, funny enough, I met Jim Palmiotti first. Mm -hmm. Jim Palmiotti back then had long hair, if you can mm -hmm. imagine that. He said no one near that long now. So, but I uh, used to have long hair down by his, his neck, and we used to kind of sit down and chit chat about, you know, what what it was like when he started well, actually inking the comics. And mm -hmm. Brian David Marshall, he uh, he was running uh, Jim Hanley's Universal at one point. He's one of the guys running the cash register. But way before then, when I was in high school. Uh, a teacher named Mr. Sarns, I still, still don't know his first name. I think it was Hank or something like that. Mm -hmm. He saw me um, kind of dueling around uh, you know, in the classroom because, you know, I had done all my credits. I didn't really have anything else better to do but just show up for one particular class anyway. And he mm -hmm. told me that he knew this guy that was doing a combo company and that he wanted to take me when I was living in Coney Island over to this place, this street in Avenue O somewhere in, in Brooklyn. In this cool house where he was showing me this guy, showing my abilities and see where we go from there. So once we got from there, we went over to like on a Wednesday, we went down there during like the middle of the day. And I just walked, walked into the house and I saw Peter Laird and uh, Kevin Eastman walking by with, uh, they just finished dropping off some uh, stuff for Brian, uh, some, of the, some of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle stuff, which I'm thinking. <laughs> There's no way that's gonna be anything, you know. That's like, oh my god, you missed all the Ninja Turtles. The Ninja Turtles, did you I, just say Teenage Mutant Teenage Ninja Mutant, Turtles? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh my god, did you know that uh, Eddie Murphy was actually supposed to be the guy and who framed Roger Rabbit? They wanted him, but uh, he turned it down. It's like, man, I'm not doing a stupid movie. And you all know how much right. money who framed Roger Rabbit made? And there's a lot of people who made decisions that they wish that just pulled all that back. This is if I just done it, you know. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, you know, of course, we all know the success that uh, Team NT is all about now. So, the brothers are back swimming in cash now. So, but uh, uh, Brian saw the stuff I was doing back then. He was doing a, a, a publishing company called Lowstone Publishing. Mm -hmm. He was putting out Thunder Agents and a couple other books also. Okay. And I was wondering who this guy was. I was able to get people like George Perez and Paul Smith to be able to draw stuff for them you know these mm -hmm. guys are high power guys is working with marvel and dc mostly marvel but george is everywhere so he was able to get him to do a couple covers and do some insides of some of the work mm -hmm. and then this guy must have some serious reach so i said okay i showed him my stuff he really liked it at that time it was what 17 18 i wasn't even 18 yet mm -hmm. so 
he would tell me I had a serious future, but he wanted to hold on to my stuff so that as time went on, you know, we could stay in touch and stuff and see how I got better, and he would be able to give me some work you know, to play with. But he kept asking if I knew what a deadline was, and I was like, well, I kind of I do, but I haven't really drawn anything to try to make any deadlines. So, mm-hmm. I mean, but I would practice doing a lot of what they call continuity pages, which a lot of the, those pages are, you know, drawing pages that tell a story without any dialogue. Right. And that's the thing. I think a lot of people uh, may be missing coming into the medium that they had to really work hard in order to create the ability to tell a story without words being on that page. And right. it's not as easy as you think. You have to be able to make make the bodies and the and the miles and the characters act in a certain way to make to make it look like it's telling that story. So mm-hmm. when they put the, the dialogue on, it means something. So um, around after that time. He kept himself, but then he kind of disappeared after I mm-hmm. left high school. I graduated and was doing, going on to other places. And then I started um, going to uh, School of Visual Arts. I think it was four years before I finally got in. Mm-hmm. And then I discovered the store, the store uh, Jim Hanley's Universe, which used to be on 33rd Street uh, between mm-hmm. 6th and 7th Avenue, I think it was. Mm-hmm. No, I think it was like around 3rd or 4th. It, it matters, trust me. So mm-hmm. at, in the end, I finally go to the store, I see him there, you know, going yeah. back and forth. And then he was working there, and then he kind of disappeared again. Mm-hmm. So now they showed they're going to get in another store in the A&S Manhattan, or A&S Mall, which mm-hmm. used to be Gimbal's a long time ago. Okay. And I was, at that point, I was working in another store called Athens Foot. I'm sure everybody's mm-hmm. been there at some point. So I went there, and I'm talking to this guy. I totally forgot what he looks like. Talking to this guy about this guy, Brian Marshall, that he's uh, – chill with, you know, mm-hmm. back when I was in high school, he said, I'm Brian Marshall. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'm Chris Cross. He's like, Cross? Man, I've been looking for you. And then we just kept hanging out. So we started doing some stuff together. He was putting out some more stuff. And then he tells me in the middle of me bringing him some pages of some stuff that he was trying to put together about this company, black-owned company called Milestone. And he was Ooh. saying uh, one, of the, one of the characters was uh, uh, a Latina who was made of bricks, and she was called Brick House. Brick House. And I was like, "Come on, man, that's so corny." Like the like the move, like like the song Brick House. They said, "Yeah, I think they have a theme." So we were just kind of laughing about it. I said, "He said you don't have an issue with drawing black characters, do you?" I said, "No. Why would I do that?" He said, "I'm You'd black." Be surprised. You'd be surprised how many uh, how many brothers, especially back in the days, didn't want to draw black characters because they didn't think they would get any real play. Mm. So I said, "I have no issue if it's." A character, if I can put my own spin on it, I'm cool with it. So he's mm-hmm. glad to hear that. And this is this is a white guy. You see him like, I don't ever think he'd be that, that in touch with it. But he he he's, he he always understood. So he gave me. Uh, he told me they were looking for artists, and that I should probably take some of the stuff that I was doing with him, show mm-hmm. them the stuff, and see what happens. So I, I made a phone call. At that time, I started going to school of visual arts. Mm-hmm. They were literally maybe three blocks away from me, going towards going across the uh, the major avenues mm-hmm. on Twenty Third Street, and I made a phone call. They said, "Come on by to doing one of my breaks after uh, one of my classes." Mm-hmm. I took a walk down there. I took it like a ninety three. Walked up there with my high top fade. Back in the days, Kwame. Yes, you may not know who that is. About to look that up. And Kwame. Uh, um... Kwame. I gotta look that up. I know kids. Yeah, that see how messed up that, that is. That's I know. Like I know kids. Kid kid play had a hot top fade, but he had his like. Yeah, it was way know. up, and it had like yeah. nice, like, a little fade in there, like a little uh, little dye going, dye job going on there. Yeah, that's how we used to roll back in the nineties, though. Okay. They still okay. trying to bring that back. Yeah. So, so basically, I walked in with my portfolio, showed them what I had, and after a lot of shenanigans, um, meeting, uh, seeing. Um, I really didn't think I was going to get anything that day. I thought it was going to wind up sending me, make me come back when they had more time. But I saw the first, I saw the office manager was named Christine Gilliam. Gilliam mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> she uh, she said, hold on, let me see uh, if I could get the guys. The guys being Dennis Cowan, Dwayne McDuffie. I think Matt Wayne was there also. Um, uh, Michael Davis was there. And so was mm-hmm. um, Derek Dingle. Mm-hmm. Priest was priest there? Was, was Chris, Chris priest, priest? priest was priest was gone by the time I got there. So okay. Okay. um I think in that he was very beginning, but by the time I showed up there, I don't think he was there. Uh, okay. I think he had pretty much left. So 
Uh, they're looking at the stuff. Dwayne looks at the stuff. He comes out, looks at me. He's a real tall dude, six foot six. He does a smile and he walks and goes back into his office. He goes into another office with the pages that I sent. He goes in. He's a Dennis Cowan comes out. He's looking at it. Then he looks at me. He goes into his office. Then Michael Davis goes in, into his office, comes out, looks at me holding the pages. He's like, you ever did any work before? I go, no. He said, interesting. He goes back into the room. Then, and then Derek Dingle comes in, out of his office, goes into their room, and they all said, why don't you come on over here? I'm like, what the hell is going on here? This is weird, right? <laughs> so after I shook hands with them, I was talking with um, Dennis Town for a bit. He's looking at the page. He just goes, okay, all right. You've done any other work? Well, I said, I did some work with a small company. Um, uh, that those particular pages, that's the stuff he's looking at now at that particular point. I said, um, it, it was this, it was that. He's like, shh, shh, shh. I said, well, <laughs> you asked me, you know, about if I did any work, he said, stop, stop, never sell your work. He said, if it's good, let it sell itself. He Don't said that, too much. he said, I'm, he said, always remember that. Hey, he, I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm sorry to cut you off. From, I, want to, I want to continue, but uh, I was watching one interview he did with someone. He told um, he told he was telling that kid like when someone comes and present their work to me, there are a few things that I immediately notice, and one of those things is this guy better than me, because I can do this myself, you know. Like, but is this guy better than me? If he's better than me, damn, why is he better than me? How's he better than me? You know, like um, what 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 makes this guy? work better than mine and um i just thought that was interesting because i was like that's how you have to get a job you know mm -hmm. somebody look at your work and go yeah come on so mm -hmm. i so boom pause i mean I play back to what you were saying yeah but <clears throat> that's usually i mean you learn that with experience that when you see someone who's really good they don't have to say nothing you've been through all the the the, the travails and all the fails and all the flip-flops and all the the successes, successes. So you know, when you see something really, really good, if it's going to be, if this guy's going to got a serious future, if he's going to fly or she, don't want to be sexist, and mm. or if that particular person's going to kind of blow out and fizzle, they're just not what you thought they were. Mm -hmm. Which means that's a lot of. It's going to be a lot. It's going to be a grind, especially when you first start because you have a lot to prove. Mm. So at that particular point, I'm going to full time in you know in college. Not realizing that by, by the time I walk out of that, I was going to have a full time assignment doing comics and going to school at the same time. So at some particular point, I had to make a decision. Mm -hmm. So of course, unfortunately, college had to go. Right. And at the same time, which I mean, the real reason why I went to college in the first place was um, to kind of kind of reference and try to you know cross connect and make you know make All right to, to set yourself you know, up what you what you were already doing like right. Right. That, that, that job marketing thing. So if I try to be able to try to get information, be able to try to get other things I couldn't normally get on my own. Mm -hmm. So I said, if I want to have to leave, then that's, that'll be what it is because right. that's what I came there for. But right. So wind up happening. So um, after I started, I think after the, the maybe the fourth book I did, I want to have to leave. I had to make a decision because there was just so much work going on between trying to make the deadlines and trying to do my painting assignments at school of visual arts, do animation, all that stuff. It was just too much. I mean, when your father, when your father had to pull you out of bed because you can't get up. Wow. You're, you're that tired. I was literally getting like two hours of sleep a night. Sheesh. It's it pressure, tough. man. That's that's the industry. That's the industry. Yeah, I, I really wanted to do this. But I pulled in that first paycheck. My father's like, oh, what is this? You wow. selling drugs, boy? What's you going on you, you know, you should something. take us out to dinner, boy. Right, like you paying, you paying for the groceries this month. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, uh, what what issue did you start on first? Because I, I read stuff online, and I want to get it from the source. It was what, number what three, issue? number three of Blood Syndicate. Blood Syndicate. Okay, you got to work with Mr. Ivan. Yeah, he he was a trip. Um, he his uh, story is well. I came in off the street. He got um he that's probably dynamic in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, he was at a comic book a comic book convention somewhere. Yeah, one of these small conventions. I think Dwayne McDuff was kind of walking around, just trying to see what was out there. Mm -hmm. And um, 
he started picking up. He had a bunch of like these ash cans back in the days of books that he was putting there called Tales from the Closet. And he had done a pretty good, sizable amount of them. And mm-hmm. he came up to, uh, I think he came up to Ivan. At some point, if you ever talk to Ivan, he'll tell you, he basically came up to him, was looking at the books, was like very impressed with the writing and the way his art looked. Because you could tell he's into the Hernandez brothers, at least, from the mm-hmm. uh, above the rocket stuff. He really loved that stuff. Mm-hmm. So his stuff really kind of mirrors that kind of uh, art style. Um, mm-hmm. So he started reading that stuff and looking at it. He was very impressed with the way he was telling stories, with his writing acumen. Right. right, with his ability to be able to kind of get you involved. So he asked him. He asked, he said, "You ever, you think you ever think about writing some um some actual you know some um higher level comics?" And he said, "Sure, I have no problem with that." So he said, "You want to write a group?" He was like, "Um, okay." So, I guess they gave him the tester. They brought him in, and basically the stuff that he wrote. I mean, it's one of those things that you were talking about. I guess Dwayne had a certain way he thought. That what's in this what's in this should go, and then he mm-hmm. saw what Ivan did. He's like, just give it to him. Again, so exactly <laughs> like um to, to to piggyback off of what you said, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but uh yeah, so yeah, like um like just talking to several milestone people, like um there are only but so many people that um that like you could just could just do that, could just mm-hmm. walk in because the majority of his recruiting uh he did was uh from Comic Cons. Um, that's how, uh, Miss Jackie told me she got on Prentice, uh, said that's how he got on, but he said once he was in, he said like, uh, he had took his, you know, portfolio, you know, he wasn't in yet, but he took his portfolio, just dropped it on Dennis' desk, just walked out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then like, <laughs> then, then Dennis was like, what's this? What is this? What is this? <laughs> I think but, everybody that saw Prentice's work did the same thing. They saw dude, what he was able to do. And was just like, like monster inker, yep, monster, monster inker. Like, like, uh, did you, did you, because you, you, you guys worked together on quite a few things, but how, how was it working with uh, Matt Wayne and Prentice on Heroes? Because I, 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 well, I really wish that that had more, um, more time. Well, Matt, I mean, he's one of those guys you just kind of gel with it going into the office. He's just always a happy guy. I was joking about something, and he's got that dry wit. If you're not intelligent enough, or like, like hanging with Dwayne McDuffie, if you don't. Read a lot, you don't get it. Nerd stuff will just fly right past you. Nerd, <laughs> yeah, nerd. You know, and you read a lot of stuff. The stuff that I didn't get, I would wind up asking where he got that from, so I could go read about. So I, I could try to hang with him. So, mm. uh, but I, as I think I, we've talked before, but we talked about how Dwayne was pretty much a genius, and uh, uh, he went he went through school, went through with flying colors. I think study, he, study, I think physics, twelve physics, physics and uh. And uh, I, I just talked to Mr. Wayne about that. He studied yeah. physics in um and uh in college, is studying to be an astronaut. And what they were doing, mm-hmm. they were taking his research because it's all new stuff. Like mm-hmm. uh, what he didn't know was that his gov- what is his professor was working for um the government at the time, and um, they was taking his research and utilizing that for stuff for projects that they wanted to do. And they didn't want to give him credit for it because he was still in college. Like, what? Are you crazy? Mm-hmm. Are you crazy? That that sounds ridiculous. But, the brother's no joke. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Just a, just a, a, a just beyond like talk about like, hidden figures, right? Yeah, yeah. That guy, that guy, that guy's brain. Just it was something. amazing. I used to just pick his brain all the time, and. He knew that I had my brain was kind of worked and working the same way. You know, we both looked the same. We were both very, very tall. We both read a lot of stuff. We, that's all we had to do, and we spent a lot of time trying to learn stuff and stay out of trouble. So, yeah, but didn't mean we didn't get into trouble from time to time, but we were smart enough to <laughs> deal with what we got. You know what I'm saying? I'm just, not gonna ask those questions. Look, Listen, you um, know, I'm just saying, you know how it is in the hood. At some point, somebody's gonna do something. You're gonna get caught up in something, and but you know, you're still trying to get out. So you're right. always trying to read something, trying to do something, you know, trying to build up that acumen so that, you know, mm-hmm. you know how it goes in the family. You got to represent yeah. your family wherever you go. So yes, where you act in the fool, your, your parents are telling you, remember, my father's a preacher. So he's always saying, oh, God won't tell me who, what you've been up to. I don't think you're going to get away with it. And, of course, you all look around like, crap, I can't do that. God looking at him. Right. You're tell him what <laughs> I'm doing, you know. But, you know, I, I was glad that I had that kind of a family, that kind of a, a situation where we were – in a lot of ways, I enjoyed learning stuff. At the same time, um, I wasn't so impressed with having to hang out all the time 
Although I did from time to time. I didn't hang out all the time enough to try to find out, try to be one of the guys all the time. I mean, right. I could I could swing out of being very intellectual or just being one of the street boys. It's all good. Right. So, But, you know, at the same time, you know, being able to meet other people that were just like you, especially someone like him, you know, it was cool to get a vibe off of that. Uh, speaking of getting to hang out with uh, some of the uh, some of your fellow colleagues, uh, you told me that y'all used to play basketball because you, you're six foot nine, right? Yeah, I'm six nine. I used to play ball all the time. So you and Dwayne McDuffie played basketball together. No, we wanted to. I told he used to play ball also, but we always had these things. We, we kind of shoot a lot of wolf ticket, you know, about uh. Who, who would be able to do what he would deal for me. I'd never get the ball. I'm like, you know, I just dunk on you, right? <laughs> you know, I, I I used to play down at West 4th Street back in the days and uh, by uh, Waverly Place, down by, uh, down in Brooklyn, where a lot of the like, NBA superstars just come down just to play. Mm. And I play one game. Is that near Rucker? I'm, I'm not from New York. Please don't. don't well, yeah, I'm from New York. You think Manhattan, 6th Avenue, there's this place, a small park that people used to be able to play uh, a lot of basketball and used to run games like, you know, 10, 15 games in a, in a couple of, a couple of maybe three or four hours. And they pick you and you say, you know, you want to be in, you want to be in, you know, raise your hand, woohoo, you know. Right. And I get, like, I'm you, like you want to play. And, you know, you kind of have, you better be able to play because if you don't, they're going to boo you off the court. Or they story like, get off here, get out of here. Get out of here. Yeah. Like, like yep. the scene so, on Space Jam, like the scene on Space Jam, I want to be. Mm -hmm. You don't even belong out here. Yep, and you better have a, here. you better have a serious, uh, a serious, Game. some rough inside, because if you're not playing, what they're gonna tell you? Right. <laughs> don't get on that court if you if you, if you booty. Don't get on that court. Right. Listen, y'all heard it here first. Chris, Chris uh, crisscross challenging me to a basketball game. I don't know this, but I'm balling myself. But you know, I don't like to brag. Listen, I'm only six foot. I don't care if you're six foot nine. I got a burden you, too. You gonna you're win now, man. Me. I got a busted knee and a bad lower back from all those times, man. So I can't here we go with the excuses. Here we, here, here we go with the excuses. Here we go. Dude, here, I'm here 52, man. I played my, I played my. I've been in the jungle, man. It's done. I'm done. I have to, I have to, uh, I have to be cool with that. That's what my <laughs> ego. Was. Your body gonna tell you when you try to jump up in there and make that shot. Like, uh oh, oh. Here we go. My back. That back of iliac. Yeah. For real, it's like your body gonna let you know you ain't going nowhere, but you're not jumping nowhere. <laughs> All right, I got a question. I got, I got a question. I got a question, Mr. 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 Chris Cross. All right, so I still um, got my threes. Though. I still got my threes, though. You still got still threes, okay? Yeah, that's why you that. might get me. You better not miss because you're going down. All right, so here we go, Mr. Chris Cross. Um, what? Um, just, we still on milestone. We we jumped into DC yet and, and later stuff on your career. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get to that too. Um, what comic, um, like what 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 issues did you have like the most fun with, brother? Blood Syndicate. Um, did you enjoy like uh, Heroes? Like did they like allow you to open up a little more with uh, Heroes or like uh, it, it was all just the same like your whole time there? Like like explain that to me. What? Brother, like, Every book that you work on is always a different experience anyway. So, yeah, if you're working on Blood Syndicate, it's a different type of, uh, um, you know, connection, different type of concept. You're doing, uh, you kind of get gritty in one way. Uh, the hero stuff is probably more fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's probably, probably as close to Avengers as you're ever going to get, really. Um, uh, because I had a different characters from different parts of the Marvel universe, like, some people from Shadow Cabinet was in there. Some people were from who had their own books, you know, Static. Yeah, was Static, part Hardware, you know, Icon, Rocket, they came yeah, up. They all had their own thing. Every once in a while, some people would show up. So uh, it was about five characters. It was, uh, it was a Blitz and Iota. Uh, Iota. Uh, Iota was Blitzen. a character from Shadow Cabinet. So yeah. I think most of them were from Shadow Cabinet. Static kind of pulled in. And then there was Iron Butterfly, who was also mm -hmm. from. Um, I, I love that character. Um, Iron Butterfly? Iron Butterfly, yeah. she was. I think she was uh, uh, Indian. Uh, off the top of the head, I don't know. I'm trying to remember. I, I think she was Indian. Um, I need to go back and check. But that's the really mm -hmm. cool thing about Miles. Don't, you forgot, forgot Donna. You forgot Donna. You forgot Donna, the, uh, the, the German girl. Yeah, I know. That was Blitzen, uh, um, Blitzen and um, 
Donna Blitzen. That okay. was um, the big girl, Donna. Yeah. That was Thunder and Lightning. Yeah. And older and I Iota, Payback, Starlight. And then uh, there's Iota. one more. And then there was the big guy. I'm trying to remember his name. Um, like I said, it's been a long time since Payback. Was, was it Payback? Payback. Yeah. Payback. Yeah. Payback. I still don't know. To this day, don't know what kind of a beast he was supposed to be. A frog. You're like a frog. I don't know. Okay. Frogish. I don't know if he was a uh, beaver or what. I don't know. To this day, I still don't know what that character was supposed to be. <laughs> kind of something Sasquatchy. I don't know. It's just right. Just whatever. Just Wookie. Wookie. A hairless Wookie. What up? What up? We, we don't exactly. Know. <laughs> well, we had fun with that. That first book I did. The first pick couple of pages. Matt Wayne said, "Go off." I said, I can do whatever I want. He said, you can do whatever you want. And then my brain said, boom. And then I started doing these pages. I was doing some of the craziest stuff. I was having fun with that book. But that was, a, of course, a different type of uh, explosion than when I was working with Blood Syndicate. Because Blood Syndicate was part novella, part, um, you know, part uh, crime story, part superhero yeah. story, part gang. You know, it was yeah. all over the place. See, so you I, had to I, make, they had to act. Yeah. Act, you know? Well, one thing I'll say about like how Ivan did um, how, how Ivan did uh, the Blood Syndicate, that was one of the first comics that I read that um, it didn't necessarily feel like a, a hero's like um, no, it, more how, it, felt like, it felt like a reality TV show. That, that's what it felt like. It felt like I was reading a reality TV show. And I was like, "This is this is crazy." I, I've I've never read this. I'm trying to pull up some pictures. Actually, I'm trying trying to see if I can find something. Here we go. I, I got one. I got one. Come on, phone. Yeah, right there. Yeah, right there, phone. Yeah, right there. Y'all see that right there? Yeah, it's the first hero. Yeah. I gotta go check that out, man. That's that's awesome. That is an awesome picture right there, man. I think I got another one right here. Yeah, I forgot about Starlight too. Yeah, Starlight. I think I think I forgot to mention her. Yeah, man, this is some awesome stuff. This is mm -hmm. some awesome stuff. Okay, so we're going to move away from Milestone because we're going to be here all day if we stay on Milestone. So um, walk, walk me through, like, um, when I know, like, Milestone went under, I want to say, officially in, like, 1997. I think so. Um, but it's been, it was it was around probably at one particular point. I, I still don't even remember the year. I just remember... I started hearing that they were having uh, that there were, there was some kind of money issue or some some sort of situation going with them in DC, so that they had to move into offices. The, the offices. Yeah, so in the last uh, couple of books I was doing with them, I had when I was bringing in uh, co uh, covers and stuff like that, I had to actually go into the DC offices, you know, to the, to the, uh, deliver them over to a particular floor that was not necessarily on a DC mm -hmm. floor. But I think it was, but it's like not was where the main offices were. Mm -hmm. It might be like the third floor or something like that. So you wouldn't see Paul Levitz walking by. You wouldn't see Paul Levitz walking by. Nah, they'll probably be on a higher floor. So um, they had um, maybe two offices, two or three offices. Mm -hmm. They were just condensed into two offices, mm -hmm. and I just thought that was pretty messed up, considering they had a whole loft floor in a building on Twenty Third Street. So um, you know. Um, I actually don't even remember the whole layout because I didn't, there was still a particular area where this stuff still had to be colored. And there was um, a lot of people who uh, used to work there that probably weren't working there anymore, but they were working in a different capacity somewhere else, maybe mm -hmm. in the building or in another office. Mm -hmm. um, Erica, uh, who used to work there, who was working at the time, she was kind of like the color editor there. Yeah, I know she Erica. Erica worked Wells. very, very hard to get, get in there. So she was doing most of the stuff. But, mm -hmm. um, I, I, didn't, I don't even think I saw her in there. I just came by to get the stuff and bring in pages and stuff, and that would disappear. And wonder what would become of Milestone after, you know, after a certain amount of time. And then I started working on, I think I went to Marvel after that. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I wound up going back to, you no, know, I went to DC. So I working at DC, and then I started working at Marvel. Mm -hmm. That's when I started doing uh, Zero for DC. Okay, yeah, and uh, 1997, 1999, with uh, you worked on that with Priest, yeah, yeah, worked on that with yeah. Priest. we had a lot of fun with that. That that was just as innovative as anything that Milestone put together. 
How how was it working with with, with, with Priest, man? Like how was Priest, that? Priest was like working with Dwayne McDuffie in a in a different on a, in an alternate universe. Wow. <laughs> because <laughs> but twins. they're the same guys like intellectually, because in a lot of ways, Chris, Christopher Priest is a genius in his, in his own right. But he's definitely heavily into the gospel. Definitely, he definitely he's a preach. He does preaching. I think he's still preaching from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, but he took a long time off after zero. He was driving buses and stuff for a while. So, but I any, heard, yeah, at any point in time, he would come back and start writing more books. I mean, he's back now. So right. uh, maybe who knows? Maybe we'll do something with zero at some point. We'll see. That'd be really cool. I like right. to revisit that character. But we had a lot of serious talks when we started working on that book and. I think when we, the stuff that we were dream casting, putting mm -hmm. together, I think it freaked out a lot of people because that, I guess they thought it was going to be a throwaway. Mm -hmm. And they kind of looked at it like it's not going to be, they're going to just put some, do some superhero stuff in that set. But we got real deep with that character. Very deep. Yep. And a lot of people don't know that that first issue wasn't the first, first issue that we ever did. There's a whole issue that no no one ever got to see that basically they had to throw away because it got all messed up. Ah oh, man. I do 22, 24 pages of uh work that got that was never shown. So that, man, that the first book was the third book. Ah. So we had to want to redoing stuff, moving stuff around. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm definitely gonna give that a read. I'm, if I can find it, if I can find a zero um Books, I, I definitely find that, but um, okay. Uh, have, I don't know if they, maybe they have them on uh comicsology. I think I don't, I'm not sure, but uh, mm -hmm. you can check. I'm gonna check them out. You are uh, you also worked on uh, Shadow Man, you worked on Shadow Love Shadow Man. I did one issue of Shadow Man, and I think that yeah, we did. I did one issue of it, and they loved what I did so much, they were actually talking about trying to get me to come back, but I was in the middle of other things, so I couldn't break away. Right, I did have fun with that book. Right, I got man. To damn it! So, I, you know what? You know what? Question I forgot to ask you. Uh, uh, Worlds collide. You worked on a little bit of that, but uh, Long Hot Summer. You said you did a lot of work for Long Hot Summer, right? Was it Worlds collide or Long Hot Summer? Uh, I did both, a lot of work on both. But uh, definitely, can we talk more, about that? I mean, because I think the law Long Hot Summer may have been longer. Mm hmm. But I think the one world squad got a whole lot more exposure, uh, of course, okay. because of the DC characters. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I got to draw Superman, and I got to draw DMZ being punched into a building by Superman. So, that oh, was like you drew that because D DMZ wasn't having that. Did you know, because he never talks. But DMZ mm -hmm. was pissed off. Like he got back up. Like, no, 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 no. Let's get into it. Let's, mm -hmm. let's get physical. Let's get. He wasn't. He wasn't having that. So that. That was freaking, um, cause I, I got to talk to, um, a, a guy who, a DC guy, um, he, um, he was telling me how he got, damn, I, I forget his name at the moment. Oh, forgive me. Uh, but he was telling me how he got on and how he remember, um, uh, when Worlds Collide happened and, um, you, you would see some milestone people at like meetings and things like, like that. But, uh, as far as like direct communication, like, you know, everybody just, had a job to do and you turn your stuff in and mm -hmm. you get your assignment and you do yours and then you turn it in and somebody else get it so because i thought like maybe y'all got to meet each other but it was like no nah, like mostly that happened at like comic cons and stuff like that so i was like okay that, that, that's cool I, I thought that was like really cool you know the fact that you know y'all got to you know work with dc people like yeah hello we're the black company um like, oh. we didn't really work with dc people so much but there were a lot of DC people that kind of stop into the milestone offices because, you know, a lot of people, I mean, Dwayne McDuffie, uh, uh, Dennis Cowan, Michael Davis, these guys used to work, had connections with DC and Marvel before. So right. them having, you know, Chris Claremont would come down from time to time. Uh, Walt mm -hmm. Simonson, I freaked out over. But I can't walk <laughs> in. And, and, and I was How like, was that? Oh, let me tell you, man. I was coming, I had a bad day that day, too. And I was just kind of going through some nonsense, and I was bringing in some pages of work. And then uh, someone said, yo, uh, so Dwayne McDuffie is standing in front of the door. I'm like, what's up? What's going on? He goes, I got a surprise for you. I said, no, you okay. Don't. I said, I said, what's up? I said, he said, someone you always wanted to meet. I was like, Walt Simonson? 
He goes, sitting in the room, man. I was like, what? I walk right past him. He's laughing his behind off. I come walking in. He's doodling, man, just doing some sketches and stuff and then inking it. I'm just sitting there like, hello, Mr. Walt Simonson, sir. My name is Chris Cross. I was like, nice and erect, coming over, being real and nice to him. Yep. Just like that. Redhead, same, same beard and everything, just doing his thing. And he was just saying, he was just saying, I'm looking at your stuff, man. I really love your stuff. I said, oh my God, I'm glad you said that. Then Chris Claremont comes walking right behind him, sitting next to him. I said, oh my God, the guys that did X Men and Teen Titans sitting right in front of me. Understand that book was like the holy grail for me. For real. So, because that, that was a weird thing that happened too, because that particular day that I got that book, I think it was my birthday. And my mother went to this this brand new um, brand new mall that showed up in uh, in Coney Island at that particular one called Caesar's Bay Bazaar. Anyone who mm-hmm. hears that who have been around that that area will know what I'm talking about. And she mm-hmm. came back. She had, she she said, "I don't know if you really like this book, but I bought you this book for your birthday." And it was X Men and Teen Titans. I was screaming like a little kid. I was like <laughs> 15 or so. So I must have bought like four or five different versions of that same book. So when I see these guys sitting there, you know. You know, the guy writing it and the guy drawing it. I'm losing my mind, man. And I told Walt Simonson, I said, you have no idea how much you mean to me and how much read looking at that stuff got me through a lot of days. You know, just learn how to draw and stuff. And he's like, he said, well, obviously it must have worked because you're here. I said, darn straight about that. I said, Walt straight. Simonson, man. So, darn straight. And I'm losing my mind, so I'm just trying to relax. because <laughs> I'm not trying to come off the two... My, I always had to think about not being too much of a fanboy because yeah. I never, you never know. I knew early on not to meet your heroes. Yeah. But he was, he's a real deal. He's all, I, I got to the point where I could call that brother dad. It was, he would call me son. It was all good. Hey. And wife Wheezy. We would just hug each other. We met each other. And it was just, it's still like that to this day. If I met him today, dad was going on. Hey, what's up, son? We hug each other. Be on. It's like, a real pop, thing. Pop, pop I'm, that's he's love. a really, really great guy, man. He's a, as real as they come, and he's uh, always been the same guy. He used to teach uh, a class in School of Visual Arts also. I used to come by and uh, help proctor with him from time to time. Yeah, so, so did you have his email? Like, how, how did you guys communicate? Cause, like, you know, I, I have, from Milestone. Uh, from Milestone, he, okay. He just... Yeah, they wanted my phone number. He was just calling me up. Hey, I need you to come down uh, and help teach a class with me from uh, so-and-so. I said, me teach a class? He said, yeah, you're professional now. Yo, bro, you can do it. I said, okay. I'm on my way. I, I, I'm on, I'll be on the first train. Yeah, I'm, man. I'm, so, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was really cool to be able to um, you know, be there and work with him and stuff and be able to talk to the, talk to, talk to the people who are willing to listen and uh, tell them how hard. It's not going to be easy when, when you're doing it. It was easier then to get in than it is now. Yeah. But it was harder then to stay in. Once you got it, now it's probably it, was, it could probably be the same way because I know that a lot of people from Europe being hired in, you know, to draw a lot of books nowadays. So they're not there's a lot. I think maybe cheaper, quote unquote, the words I want to say, at least expensive, you know, to hire guys. Those guys are nothing to sneeze at though, because they work very very hard. A lot of these guys compensatory. They're using digital, uh, digital. Um, Files and stuff like they playing with Cintiqs and they're drawing straight on the computer straight from. And I'm kind of messing. Around. I just bought a Cintiq, but I've still yet to really play with the way I need. I was to just about business. to ask you that. I was just about to ask you that. Um, like, uh, what what type of um, like material do you use to to draw? Because um, I've seen, you know, <laughs> I'm not supposed to be saying this. <laughs> uh, Dennis Cohen, he. Um, He's kind of a little bit of both. You know, he got like the little electronic thing. He might do that, but then yeah. he might take it old school and sketch it out on a piece me. of paper, you know, like how yeah. everybody else do it. So, you mm-hmm. know, like uh, that that was my question to you. I think I asked you that before. Like, uh, what, what kind of materials do you use? What kind of pencils do you use? Um, if they want you to color it, what do you color it with? Like, uh, let's, let's jump into it. Pencil. Wow. That's what I use. You know, erasers. Electronic, electrical erasers, the electrical electrical kind with the batteries, um, you know. Wow. But I also, you know, I play with uh, you know, just you know, paper. You know, it's old school. Uh, 
I'll do a lot of what I what I want to plan to do on the paper. And that's I have like a whole bunch of files I basically saved up that I want to use if I want to play around with it, uh, Photoshop or whatever. Several other programs if I want to mani manipulate certain photographs and I'll just try, try to get what I'm looking for and kind of work with, if I'm inking myself, work with what I'm trying to put together, kind of fill up space here and there or stuff, you know, computer programs I can use you know, to create certain images that can marry in with the stuff I actually drew so you it'll be seamless so you can't tell what's what, who drew what, mm -hmm. me or the computer. So it's 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 all tools, you know, it's all it's all I mean the computers the Macs that I use is all computers. Mm -hmm. And the Cintiq, I still have yet to really pull out and really play with the way I want to. I've been so freaking busy mm -hmm. trying to get stuff ready to go. But at some particular point I have to find a way to just kinda cut off that stuff and just work on that Cintiq and just try to get some stuff done through that and see what, where right. it goes on, on the next level of what I can do with this stuff I mean, because uh, the program you can play with, yeah, it's off the hook. I, I, that's what I was just about to say. Uh, because I, I had a friend who, uh, like, uh, like I used to do, like I told you, I did like you know, little comics here and there when I was in high school to keep me out of trouble, and uh, just the process of editing that is just like the devil. Do like I used to have because I did everything myself. I you know I, I drew everything myself, um, I colored everything in, I put the words and everything myself. I did the whole shebang myself. Mm -hmm. But just to have to go back and edit that was just mm -hmm. like hell to pay right. because I had okay I had this this um, glass table in my uh, dad's house and I used to take like a um, I used to uh, edit at night when it was mm -hmm. dark and everybody was sleeping out my way. Um, I take a flashlight and put it under the table so I could like go back and like. Trace like outline everything oh, on a new yeah, piece of paper. Right, right table. Yeah, and I, I I used to have to do like I used to do like I had like whatever it takes, like a, man. It's press it's pressure. It's pressure. Mm -hmm. I know how like difficult it could be to just you know try to fill in spaces, certain boxes. And like, that was my next question to you. Um, what what was easier for you to draw the characters or to draw the scenery? And um, how did you learn to you know um. To, uh, to to do both, like uh, like like I want to talk about that a little draw bit. Draw the characters or the what now? Like what what was easier for you to draw? Like what what came natural? Like drawing the, the characters or drawing like the scenery, like buildings and stuff like that. You know, like a bathroom, you know, a living room, you know, cars, things like that. Well, uh, none of it came easy, but it's, of course it's always going to be easy to, to do figures first because that's what you're going to practice on first. Right. But um. When you start developing a thirst to make sure that you start understanding that the backgrounds are as much a story as the characters are. Mm -hmm. And if you have to tell stories, the characters got to be somewhere. You know, mm -hmm. if you're going, they're going to be down the street, it has to look like a certain street. If they're going to be in a building, it has to be a certain building. Mm -hmm. If you're doing, uh, you know, uh, time, you know, characters, I mean, backgrounds that have a certain amount of uh, time, uh, time displacement, you know what I'm saying? It could be whether it's medieval or futuristic or uh, some kind of science fiction thing going on or just some wasteland. You got to be able to have some sort of um, some kind of cognizance of what you're going to draw. So that takes mm -hmm. a lot of research. Right. Um, it's, some things are easier than others, of course, because if you're doing tons of buildings, that's always going to be harder because, once again, it's just the voluminous mm -hmm. amount of detail you have to put in this stuff in order to figure out What's going to be what? What does it look like? What kind of a? Because Gotham looks different from Metropolis, which looks different yeah. from New York City, yeah. or Chicago. Yeah, even if they say those characters, those two, two, those two uh, towns are kind of, you know, kind of derived from each one of those cities. But, um, but they all have a certain look to them, and they have to be able to look that way. Right. So you have to pull people in. So. When taking that kind of thought process going forward, whenever you're drawing something, you have to make sure that people are going to be able to recognize what they're in. Right. You know, and you got to understand mood lighting, and you got to be able to understand, you know, uh, you know, you know what time of day it is, all that, you know, yeah, like, you know, you know facial you know, expressions. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it, there's so many different terms you have to learn, you know, to understand this stuff. So you learn that stuff as you continue to go in. Mm -hmm. Um. And one of the really, really great things that they had at that time was uh, the official Marvel, uh, official guide to Marvel, Marvel uh, draw them, how to draw them, how to draw, how to draw Marvel. I think it was the official guide to Marvel Universe or something like that. No, it's yeah. one of these things that um, uh, that Marvel put out that you were supposed to be able to draw 
be able to, you know, you could write, they show you how to write what a script looks like, and you could take what you saw in the script, but they give you, um, uh, it was like, um, you know, uh, paper, you know, paper, you know, big 11 by 17 bristle board paper. It was all connected in a book. And you had to be able to draw panels with, uh, based upon, I think it was David Michelini or somebody else who wrote the stuff. Mm-hmm. Then JR, uh, John Romita Jr. did some of the actual pencils so you can see what it looks like in blue. And you could be able to ink that stuff and that stuff you can actually color in there also. So they had, uh, there's a trial book. It's called the Marvel Trial Book. The official mm-hmm. Marvel Trial Book. And you should look, when you ever get a chance, you should look it up on the web. I'm sure someone is still selling it. You probably have to pay through the nose in order to get it, but um, someone is probably still selling it. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those official trial books that was able to give you an idea of what comic book, comic strip, comic book type uh, scripts are, are like as opposed to like a teleplay or anything else mm-hmm. or a movie script and then be able to show you how it's, each panel is broken down and show you what the dialogue is supposed to be and the plot mm-hmm. for each panel to show how things go, you know, mm-hmm. with there that will jump, jump from building to building. He sees something blow up, you know, an explosion go off and, and you know, uh, ahead of him, he's kind of jumping towards so you have to be able to make that so progress in every panel. Right. And then, of course, you see the, the bad guy that's making it happen, and you have to get the reference to make sure that each of these buildings that he's jumping on looks like Hell's Kitchen of some right. sort. It's a lot of research, and it takes a lot of time. You have to be able to do it in a dynamic way where you can be able to show that the characters operate within that panel, and there's a world in each one of those panels, mm-hmm. and that every single uh, gutter that they call it, that between the borders is like a time displacement from the first panel to the next. Mm-hmm. Scott McCloud had a really good book out that told about uh, comics, how to, how comic books are made and what they look like. You ever get right. a chance to look that up also. Okay. But, um, he's got an award, got awards for that. <clears throat> but but that, that all that's supposed to be able to work in its way, be able to show you how to be able to tell a story in the best mm-hmm. way possible. And when it's, you know, when you finally do it right and you know you start to do do it in a particular way, then you continue to carry that forward towards the next book going mm-hmm. forward also right because I, I know like um i know like the script helps you like um see like what you what, what the direction that they want to go and then like you you know depending on what, what you can draw what you can't draw um you know you you would try to incorporate as much as you can from uh the script and i noticed that with um with your visuals like how like detailed you are with certain things like if it was like a a cat walking in the back, you make sure you draw that in, like a uh, certain like like dude. I like I look at some of the like no no offense to any of the people that work with you, uh, some of the color wrist, um, they really bring the image of what you're trying to um what 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 you what you draw, they really bring that to life. And uh it's the question of um who are some colorists that just really I know you say you love Christopher Priest, that was the inker, he's an inker, but who who are some uh colorists that just really you just really just admire? Like um, the way that they color, like your stuff. Well, it's kind of hard because there's a lot of people who I've worked with. Um, um, top five. Huh? Top five. Top five. Jeez. Um, let's see. Uh, well, at that time, the person who I was working with that I thought was very impressed was Steve Olaf. He mm-hmm. started. He was kind of the father of the uh, computer color process. Mm-hmm. But he started all the optics back in the days. And um, the person, when you started seeing computer color, it came from mm-hmm. him. I don't know if he gets any props for that, but he brought that props. He started coloring stuff in Photoshop and started using that as a guide in order to get other people to be able to uh, color the same way. So it started a new trend in, in coloring. Because before mm-hmm. they used to use uh, uh, ink dyes. Uh, mm-hmm. St. Martin's color dyes. They used to be able mm-hmm. to color, sort of like watercolor dyes, they'd be able to color on top of a uh, watercolor paper they were printed on top of. Mm-hmm. They were working that way. It was a four color process that people were using. They all had like this uh, RGB uh, or um, it was an RGB, if you had a y, the y, YCMK type mm-hmm. palette they, they'd be able to use for whatever uh, book they were using. Mm-hmm. And then that was for the printer to be able to do that, that type of thing once they played with it. But let's see any other colors. But he was the one of the guys that colored my stuff that I had a lot of fun with. Mm-hmm. Um, Chris Odomayor, he he did some. He kind of jumped in after uh, uh, Steve Olaf. Um, 
Let's see. Um, it's one of the best colors. Oh my God, you put me on the spot. <laughs> all right, bro. We, we, all right, all right. We, we, we can move on. We, we can Jose move on. Villarubia, he did some really great stuff over me. Uh -huh. Um, Marcello, um, um, Ma, Ma, how do I, I keep saying Mayolo, Marcello Mayolo. He was another guy who was really, really good at what he did. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let's see, um, Javier, uh, my god. They're coming to me. It's so many people trying to. It, and I see you blew my head up, man. It's like, um, let's see, uh, who else? Who else? Who else? Um, let's see if I can find this. Even Snake here. Bite was another guy that I worked with who was really mm -hmm. good at what he did. Um, there's a lot of people I played with who, who was able to kind of tap into my mind. I was able to say, I'm looking for this. And I do a lot of color notes for them. And I was saying, and they would just blow it up on the spot. They mm -hmm. had fun with it. But, uh, you know. You know, we had there was a lot of people. That's the thing about colorists. That was uh, this guy, uh, Felix Serrano, who I basically went to uh, college with. He did some great uh, color work also. He did that work on um, on um, Spike. That's Spike, that's right? Spike. Right. That's Spike. That's Spike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, right. I, think that, I think that was the first issue. I think. Next question. Next question. Um, a colorist can make you or break you. I know Derek Dennis, everybody is great. Uh, but from Milestone, like who who's somebody that you really just took like a lot of um like who who do you feel like influenced you the most? Like from a milestone. Like um and that's no disrespect to any of the other uh, uh in what way? Uh with just motivating you to, you know, just uh like be in the industry and you know, just you know, do your best to what you can do. Well no question. It was definitely people the guys in milestone, Dennis. Uh, Derek, Derek Dingle, we have our talks. Um, uh, that Dwayne McDuffie, of course. Every once in a while, it would be Michael Davis when he was zipping, running around, and doing something else. But yeah. definitely, for the most part, it was Derek Dingle, Dennis Cowan, and um, Dwayne McDuffie. And right. to the point where I would call Dwayne and Dennis Uncle Dane, Uncle, Uncle, Uncle Dwayne, and Uncle Dennis. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and every once in a while, I still mess with Dennis like that. I call him Uncle Dennis. He's like, you need to stop that. Like, but you're a grown I man now. They're the big brothers in the industry. They saw it. I mean, th these are guys who joined, you know, The Question, Deathlock. I mean, he did uh, Power Man, Iron Fist for uh, a certain amount of time. You know, Dwayne McDuffie. Dwayne McDuffie worked on Captain stuff. Marvel, too. He, 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 he worked on the, uh, he worked on um, um, Monica Rambeau's Captain uh, Captain Marvel, though. Mm -hmm. they, they, and they also did something for Prince. That was crazy. Like, I yeah, saw that, that the Prince. Yeah, he did that. Um, it was great <laughs> to meet Mark Bright. Mark Bright was a really good... Um, 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 mentor for me, you mm -hmm. know, people don't know that he used to paint and do a really great uh paint. Uh, these kind of uh, these uh, uh, oil paintings of uh, from mm -hmm. um, uh, oil, oil pastels, you talking about the pastels, yeah, like he did like the pastels of crayons, okay, great, okay, okay. All, all pastel, all crayons. He did some really great stuff for that stuff, like the science fiction stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, and he got really paid really well for that stuff, also. But you know, Mark Bright did what he had to do, and he's just he's out. But he was always telling me, he was always saying, uh, you have to maintain who you are as a brother in, in the industry because a lot of people may or may not like you, may not take to you well. You're going to recognize that going forward. Just make sure that in doing so that you don't allow them to, you know, take you out of something that you love or what you dream. You know, I have had those people be able to sit down and talk with me and show me, you know. Mm -hmm. Some stuff I had to see firsthand. Some things you, have, you, have, you hear about, you see the aftermath of it. But... You know, no matter where you go, you have to be. He was always taught you got to be three times better than the next man. Right. You draw I, well, but you got to be three times better than the next brother. I heard um, Joe um, Illich say uh, once he, he left Milestone and uh, worked with you know, other people that was so impressed that he knew so much, but he knew what it really was. Like, why does this black guy know all this? And he was like, well, I was trained by Dwayne McDuffie. Yeah, that's always that impression. <laughs> they think that because I don't, I had no idea why. It was something about the the way that people would kind of look down on Milestone back in the days, and the way that they kind of did certain things that made them think that they're inferior, but we're superior because we're one of the big two. You know, right. and there were certain editors that had that kind of thought process. Some of them were not really working in comics anymore, mm -hmm. but um. I don't really need to name them, but right, we gonna name drop. Nah, I don't need to name name those people, but 
Uh, we used to go through, we used to kind of get that that vibe, like that you know, energy. you're working in the big leagues now. It's not the same type of stuff you did before. I'm like, but if we had the same stuff that you were working with, you wouldn't be talking like that. We had to work with what what we had, you know. Right. But we still did well with it. Right. We told great stories. We still had a, the color process may not have been up to snuff, which mm-hmm. we thought it should be, but we did eventually get into into the whole computer color uh, separation process. They call it color separations back then. Uh huh. And we were able to do some better stuff with brighter paper and stuff like that. And right. then, of course, with, with stuff like that comes with a whole different type of management that eventually starts to cause a lot of problems. But um, at some particular point, that started to happen, which kind of started a certain amount of a breakdown with the relationship between Milestone and D.C., which is why they had to go back to, to the offices and eventually got shut down. So I I heard. I'm not gonna get into it. No, we're not gonna get into it. But we're not gonna get into but, it because like, I wasn't there. But it hurt was... a lot of people. It hurt a lot of hearts, man. Because we were a family. We still we still get together to this day. So we've been making it uh, more of a a situation where um, a purpose, I should say, that at least every every year or so we all at so one particular day we all meet up. Those that can all meet up and go get something to eat and go hang out. And chit chat and laugh and eat and talk about stuff. Talk about Dwayne McDuffie. Talk about um, uh, people who died that we knew uh, who don't really uh, go on part of the uh, milestone makeup anymore, but will always be a part of milestone. And you know, everyone just does this thing. We'll just catch up. But you right. know, we see. How, I mean, we still keep in touch with them. And at, at any point, we could come up with our own stuff and come up. You know, do some other stuff because in some cases, I've been still writing. He's still doing his own stuff. Um, about to put out some uh, some stuff of his own. Um, mm. Joe Ellis, he's got his stuff ready to go. He's doing a lot of consulting stuff with the editorial stuff on his own freelance. Um, Eric Well, um, Eric uh, Erica Well, she calls herself. Erica's uh, awesome. Eric, I, I talk My to Erica girl. every now and then. Erica's awesome. Yeah, Erica's awesome. I'm trying to get um, an interview. She's with doing her own stuff. She's always doing her own stuff. Jackie, you know, she's in England with her superstar daughter. You know, oh wow, acting. yeah, her and our uh, princess daughter who's been acting, they sing and do all kinds of stuff. Yeah, they, they awesome. I saw that girl, she was a baby. Now I'm looking at her like I see her on Netflix. That's crazy, yeah, you know, that's so crazy. you just never crazy. know. You know, what I'm saying Jason Scott Jones, who's one of the colorists of a lot of the, a lot of the books, he's you know, doing a lot of stuff for uh, major companies like ESPN and um, mm. you know, uh, other sports companies, other. Companies that want him to do a lot of uh, digital and um, computer software stuff, a lot of animation and stuff like that. So everyone's in there doing their thing, man. They're, they're working right. hard. Yeah. I have one. I had a few. Damn, I had a few questions for you, but we almost out of time. Um, what was the one comment? Yeah, we, we're talking about almost six years. You talk about thirty years of my life, man. You you gonna <laughs> run out of tape. So. Um, what was the one common issue that you um you you were telling me about? That you and uh, I think your 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 writer uh, was working on, and y'all had to go to like the big guy. Y'all had to go like to the boss's executive and go, "Yo, look, um, this is your way. This is our way. Our way is selling. Why can't we take our way and and, and run with this? Let's let's see, let's let's do this. Let's see where it goes. Like I think he, was that for zero? Or was that for something else you were talking about? I think it was zero. Zero, okay. Oh, well, see, zero is a it's an it's an amazing concept in and of itself. It was something that Christopher Priest came up with, uh, called the close at one point. Uh, oh. He basically created this guy. His name um, his name was Coltrane Walker, mm-hmm. and he was a um, he was a an agent, and uh, mm-hmm. some 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 major thing, some major accident happened to him, where he wound up having his brother uh, was really into. Uh, science or something, so he was doing a lot of um, um, a lot of, uh, I'm trying to remember the actual term that he used. Well, he's basically he, he put his brother back together. And oh, man. Built, built, uh, like his, most of his body, it was like some kind of acid thing that kind of melted away a lot of his body. So he built his brother a frame inside of his body that allowed him to be able to uh, you know, be able, to live, be able to walk, be able to function. But he created this thing called the drivetrain that was supposed to be able to pop him up every 24 hours. 
So he'd be able to do what he did, but he had to come back to the drive train or to power back up, otherwise he, otherwise he would die. Oh, man. He would lose power and die. So his cover, he, well, he was a basketball player, but he was dressed like he was a white guy when he was zero, but he was of himself when he was playing basketball. So they actually had a like an NBA style, you know, type of uh, setup where he was playing for a particular team it was either Detroit or California, someplace like that. And they had a particular name that's would go back and go check out. But he had to, he was a professional basketball player that had his own persona. But in the end, like back in the corner of the dark, he was this crazy agent who was called the closer. That's and, crazy. And each one of these agents that were also closers, they all had not had numbers. He was zero, which means he had to fight to get to that. That was the top agent, the top closer. These guys show up, you're dead. There's no, there's no bargaining with these guys. They, you've been hired to take this person out, period. That's it. You're not going to stop them. Sheesh. So in between that going on, there's stuff he had to deal with, the basketball going on. He had to deal with his brother, his antics. He also had to deal with maintaining, trying to maintain some sort of a personal life at the same time. Right. Deal with these adventures that he's been going, these missions he's been going on, had to close out people. One of the people he was had to take off, I think it was the third issue, he had to kill who was someone who was perceived as the Antichrist. It was beat, man, I'm telling you. And uh, there was another kid who was uh, taken from her home as an orphan, and she was trained to be this killer, this master assassin. And uh, he was trained that he had to come and try to take her out. Mm-hmm. And she gave him serious problems. She must have been like 12. Like a 12 year old, but she was Man. so like all these shows, like Hannah and you know, the movie, it was, it was like that one, but on some other level. That's and crazy. Had this really cool car called a drive train, also, which we, which we, which we um, can't, I'm t- can't talk today, which would be able to morph <laughs> into an SUV or a truck or a race car. Transform. It could fly. It was, it was called the drive train, which also used, also used to kind of power him up, also, because you'd be able to connect to that car. And mm-hmm. there was a lot of really cool things going on with that particular that ish goes uh, that concept. And the very first uh, issue is with him fighting on with, with this uh, ship, this uh, submarine called the Greta Garbo, mm-hmm. and it was in the shape of a dolphin. Mm-hmm. And it was it was straight up James Bond style, straight up like you know Die Hard. He came in, he's supposed to close somebody out, and then it, it just kind of went haywire. He just had to kill everybody off and. There's you know, a lot of rich people running, trying to find a way to get off that ship, trying to get oh. to the dock bay to get away. It was all that crazy stuff. And that was the intro. That's, so we, that, that's we wild. put that stuff together. So they didn't think that it was going to be something that was going to wind up. They was putting out a bunch of books that was supposed to be filled for uh, a lot of people of color, a lot of diversity. But they didn't think there was going to be a lot of thought put into this book. So when right. people start to really buy into it. They started having concerns, like, well, we thought we were just going to physical and die, but it's not happening that way. Bless it's you. not happening now. We, it's not happening. We it's, it's starting to become really good. And to this day, I don't think, bless you again. Fast um, sneeze. To this day, I think no one still has caught up to that book. No one's caught up to that book. I'm going to have to I'm gonna have to catch that out, but real quick. Yeah, so it was only 12 issues of work. I did maybe 10 issues of it because I wound up started working on uh, X Men and then Captain Marvel after that. Cool. Real quick, I gotta shout this book out. Shout out to my man. Uh, it's actually showing uh, backwards. Hang on. Well, yeah, um, it's the case. It's, it's it's a comic series. Uh, they they had a crazy freaking quick Kickstarter. Um, that just has so much success. They were able to just push out so many books. My man Quasi. Yeah, well, yeah, Qu- um, Mr. K. I call him Quasi. Oh, Saifu. Uh, and this is black. Where uh, in this fictional universe, uh, only black people have um, power. Well, they're naturally born with power. Now, other people um, can probably get it through like experiments, but yeah, Black is an right. amazing freaking comic book. Um, mm-hmm. And I would definitely recommend y'all go check this out. I have to grab it. Dude, I got the book. Oh, Come you on, got man. it? I, I got that book. Come on. Yeah, I know you do, cool. but the, I'm talking to the people at home. They might, they might okay. not have it. Because I always, you know, you know, I always got to shout people out. I don't, it's, White's not out yet, right? White? No, nah, nah, White's not out yet. Okay. White's not out yet. But listen, Mr. Crisscross, we are all 
out of time. Listen, I can go on all day talking yeah. to you, Mr. Chris Cross. I know you're a busy man. I know you got a lot of work you got to get back to. Yeah, you got me. That anybody you want to shout man. out? That anybody want to shout out? Your colleagues from Marvel, DC, Milestone, anybody? Anybody want to shout out? Now the time to shout them out right now. Um, uh, uh, man, shout out my boy John, uh, Sean Martin, bro. Shout out, of course, jo Joseph Village. Uh, been rolling rolling that book since high school. So, uh, you know, my wife, of course. Um, there's tons of people that I work with, uh, you know, to this day that I made great relationships with. All, most of my wild milestone buddies, J, J. Scott Jones, of course, you know, you know, Jackie, you know, Prince, you know, Erica Well, you know, all of those guys. You know, uh, how they are. Uh, those are my OG people. Anderson. OG Anderson, another guy. I interviewed him too. That's my man. Of course, Dennis Cowan, uh, yeah. Derek Dingle, you know, the late great uh, Dwayne McDuffie, his my wife, his. his his uh, uh, widow wife, who I just finished working with not too long ago with Green Lantern. Nice. Um, that was great to do. She was on the bucket list and still is. Um, I could go down the whole list. But um, definitely. Shout them uh, all out. I do. I could go down the whole list. But, you know, there's a lot of people I in, intend to work with. Some people, uh, some stuff I'm putting together myself at some particular, to some particular point. And I'll definitely shop that out when it's ready to go. Um right. Just want to make sure that people understand that it's not it's not over for me by any stretch of the imagination. I still have a lot of stuff to put my hands in. I'm just getting started. I have to start putting my own stuff out at some point. So um, when that comes out, people are gonna know about it. Well, listen, y'all heard it here first. Chris Cross coming out with some new stuff, and we're gonna be the first to get a hold up, and so we can talk about it. Man, y'all know what time it is. Listen, Trayvon Copeland, milestones on Mr. Chris Cross. I was eating myself a hand, my brother. Yeah, that's right. It was absolutely. Don't forget to catch me on Facebook. I'm yeah. on Facebook. Yeah. Oh, well, well, yeah, what, what can they find you? What can they? Because he, he does commissions as well. If mm -hmm. y'all if y'all want to find him on Facebook, what what else can they find you, Miss Chris Cross? Uh, you call me, catch me at, at Chris Cross Rex on um, Instagram. You catch me. It's gonna be Chris Chris Williams on a uh, uh, Facebook. For some reason, won't let me use Chris Cross. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm on Tumblr too. I think Chris okay. Cross Rex the same thing. But uh, those are those are the two that you'll know. I'm on Twitter also, mm -hmm. so at Chris List. Um, but those are the three that you'll three uh, social media networks you'll find me on for the most part. Uh, fact, Facebook, tw uh, Twitter, and on our Instagram. Listen, y'all, y'all listen to me, man. I got nothing but absolute love for this brother. This brother is so talented in so many ways. This drawing is absolutely second to none. I love this man like an uncle that I've never met. He is the man. This is Chris Cross in the flesh, ladies and gentlemen. Y'all say what's up, and we are out. Chris Cross, thank you so much, man. Thank you, right, love. Thank you, Cross, on his way out, yo. Peace. Peace.